Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Again, thank you for being with us. Uh, today we're reporting to you that we have diagnosed an additional 500-500 cases of COVID-19, bringing the number confirmed in this country to 6,574. Uh, there have been an additional 28 deaths, bringing our total number of deaths to 263. Uh, of those 28 deaths, 13 of them are males, 15 of them are females, and 19 of them uh, we have reports of an underlying uh, medical condition. And I'd like to take this opportunity as ever to express our condolences to the family and friends of each and every one of these people. Uh, a little more detail on the breakdown of deaths, 263 as I've said, uh, 187 of them were hospitalized at some point and, and died in a hospital environment, that's 72 uh, percent. 30 of them uh, died in an ICU environment, that's 11 percent. We have reports of underlying medical conditions in 214, which is 81 percent. The male-female breakdown is 161 males, 102 females, and that's approximately 60-40, and the median age of all deaths is 81. In terms of more detailed breakdown of cases, uh, as of midnight, Tuesday, the 7th of April, of 6,444 cases, 1,521 had, had been admitted to hospital at some point, that's 24%. 230 to an intensive care unit, that's 3.6%. Uh, we had reports of 317 clusters accounting for 1,391 individual cases, 21.6 uh, of the overall number. We had uh, reports of uh, 1,765 healthcare workers infected are 27%, and the median age of all the incident cases is 48 and uh, Dublin, again, 55% accounted for by people uh, from County Dublin. In terms of the German cases that I've been telling you about over the course of the week, an additional 3,257 samples, 427 are reported as positive, giving a positivity rate of approximately 13%. And then a more detailed breakdown of intensive care unit admissions of 242 admitted 153 of them are currently in hospital, that's 63 percent, and bear in mind that the majority of ICU admissions in number of terms have happened within the last 10 to 14 days. Uh, 24 percent of them have been discharged, that's 59, and there have been 30 deaths uh, reported among that number in a, an ICU environment, that's 12.4 percent. 193 of them, or 80 percent, have an underlying illness and the median age of those admissions to intensive care is 60. I'm now going to introduce again Professor Philip Nolan, President of Maynooth University, who's chairing our large team of uh, modelling experts and is going to share some additional thoughts and some information with you. So, Philip. Thanks, <coughs> Thanks Tony. So, just as a starting point, um, we've been monitoring the epidemic very closely. And as I would have said last week, there's clear evidence that the social distancing uh, measures that are designed to reduce the transmission of the virus are very, having a very profound effect on the transmission of the virus. And we know that, first of all, because we're seeing uh, a day-on-day -day reduction in the growth rate of the epidemic. In other words, how many more cases do we have on a given day uh, compared with the preceding day, averaged over the preceding uh, five days? At the beginning of the epidemic, that was over 30 percent increase in confirmed cases per day. Last week, it was down to 15 percent increase uh, day on day, and we're now a little bit below 10 percent, so it's 9 percent over the, uh, the last five days. So the, the growth in cases is slowing down, but frankly, that number needs to be zero uh, in order to have controlled or suppressed this epidemic. The second thing that we're seeing, which is reassuring, even though we don't uh, uh, want people to be admitted to intensive care, uh, last week, worryingly, the number of people in intensive care was growing very rapidly. Uh, for the last few days, that has been stable, uh, around 140 to 150 people in intensive care. Uh, and if the disease is suppressed, one would expect that number to decline uh, over the coming week or 10 days. <coughs> The third thing that we're monitoring, excuse me, the third thing that we're monitoring is a very important indicator of the epidemic, and that's the uh, effective reproduction number. 
And that's, that, in essence, is for any one person who's infected with uh, the virus, how many other people do they infect? And obviously, social distancing measures reduce the opportunity for transmission and therefore reduce uh, the reproduction number. And at the beginning of the epidemic, that was in the region of uh, uh, four, or a little bit over four. Um, uh, when we closed schools, we measured it at around 2.7. And we're comfortable that number now is very close to, what, to one, so that each individual is infecting one other individual on average. But I say very close because that very close is critically important. Uh, if that number is even a little bit over one, cases will grow slowly but inexorably. If it's a little bit less than one, the number of cases will decline, and it's very sensitive to what that is. So we know it's close to one, but we don't know precisely what it is. Is it a little bit above one or a little below one? We can't answer that question with confidence just yet. I want to reassure you, I'm not trying to blind you with science, but this, this is the structure of the model. I just want to reassure you that the model is robust to late tests or missing cases. In fact, we assume that for every five cases we detect, there's five cases that we don't detect. Uh, most of them, three or four cases, because they're asymptomatic or their symptoms are so mild, they don't come to the attention of doctors. And one or two cases because of limitations in testing capacity or that person simply didn't uh, get tested. So we model on the basis uh, that we will not detect every case uh, and work from that basis. And I'm going to show you one piece of information in terms of what these models produce. Um, and it's a, it's a somewhat uh, uh, frightening scenario. Uh, so this is, um, and I'm sorry it's such a blurry slide, this is an early run of the model, uh, well calibrated. And it's what would have happened if the epidemic had been unmitigated. So the blue curve there is what would have happened had no public health measures been put in place. Uh, day zero is the 29th of February, day 40 uh, is today. And what would have happened in that circumstance uh, is that within uh, uh, 20 days from now, we would have had a peak of 100,000 cases per day in the population. Uh, as of today, we would already be well overwhelmed. The red curve is what would have happened if we had flattened the curve simply by closing schools, universities, and implementing basic social distancing measures and got that R value down from four people infected for every one person to uh, a little bit under three. And again, you can see uh, about 40 days from today, uh, we would have uh, encountered an overwhelming peak of infection of close to 60,000 uh, uh, cases. And that's assuming an asymptomatic fraction of 50%. So there's lots of other people out there whose symptoms are too uh, benign to be detected. So what that demonstrates is this is not a question of flattening the curve. This is not a question, simple question of flattening the curve. It's not simply a question of pushing the peak out into the future. It's a question of completely suppressing this disease. Suppress it, pushing down that curve so flat that there's barely a peak detectable at all and we're spreading a large number of cases out over a very prolonged period of time. And we are modeling now what the future is going to look like if we maintain our very close to one, a little bit above one, a little bit below one, and we'd be able to share that when we understand better what's going on right now, just how close to that critical reproduction number of one are we. And that message then is to the public is uh, we've done extraordinarily well in getting that reproduction number down so close to one. We really need to keep that up First of all, to make sure precisely where we are. And secondly, we will be requiring very strong social distancing measures for some prolonged period of time in order to keep the, the disease suppressed uh, for the length of time that we need to. Thanks very much, Philip. We're happy to take any questions that you might have now. Okay, Zara King, Virgin Media News. I might just pick up on that last point that you made there, Philip, in relation to uh, social distancing measure measures for a prolonged period of time. What does that look like exactly? Are we talking about people still sort of staying within a two-kilometre boundary of their home, or what, what do you envisage that to look like in best-case scenario? So, so, th so that's not for me to say. 
Um, what, what we understand now is we, we do need this huge suppression of the disease and we can look at how the various measures that have been taken to date affected that reproduction number the more data that we get in and we can also look at the experience of other countries uh, so we're looking at Austria, Norway, Denmark and seeing as they change their measures uh, what happens their reproduction number and that will act then as a guide to the Chief Medical Officer and Government about how much can we relax and how precisely can we relax. So I'm not holding anything back, it's just we really need to see what's going on here and what's going on everywhere else before we make those really quite risky decisions. We can't get this wrong, so we have to be very careful we have all the information available before we make those decisions. Thank you. Uh, Tony, just in relation to testing, this is just something that crossed my mind the other day. Obviously, we're doing around 2,000 tests a day at the moment, and the ultimate goal is to get to the 15,000 a day mark. Um, you're getting a 19% positive at the moment. Is it fair to say then, based on those figures, that we might be missing in excess of 2,000 positive cases of coronavirus on a daily basis now by not being at the capacity we need to be at to detect it? So, uh, as Philip has kind of, in a way, covered this point, uh, that there are two reasons why people who are infected in the population might be missed in broad terms. Uh, so we can have asymptomatic or, so, or cases of infection that are so mild in their symptomatology that they don't prompt action and people don't come forward and get tested. And the second is that maybe we're not testing quite as many as that we would want of the people who do identify themselves and have come forward for testing. And we know and we've been clear we've had a challenge in relation to that. The model, as Philip is saying, has built in those kinds of assumptions that around five out of every ten uh, of cases that occur in that way uh, are, are not picked up and, coming, and come to our attention. And so the model in terms of what it's saying to us and the conclusions we might be able to draw from it are not impacted by that or impacted by that significantly. It will change the number that we give you each day. So the number you see today is 500, which is a bigger number than we've given you before. And we think that extra testing capacity that we're growing now has made a contribution to that, that increase in number rather than that per se solely a change in the underlying uh, rate of the disease. I think the important message to leave you with, Sarah, is that we still see some growth in the disease on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, and we're, we still have uncertainty about precisely uh, how, what, what that level of growth is, how much above zero is it, or in terms of the reproductive number, how much above one or around one is it, and we think that the observation of the next number of days uh, will be important to us to, 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 to establish that, uh, and to answer the kind of question you were asking, Philip, there a moment ago, and formally we come to the National Public Health Emergency Team tomorrow morning to again review the measures that are in place, again make an assessment of, of what period of time and what measures should pertain and we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that in, in, in tomorrow's communications. Next question, please. Hi, uh, could I, it's Susan Mitchell from the Business Post, could I get some indication about the roadmap for the country in terms of, you know, what is the medium term plan you know, Professor Nolan outlined trying to get the or not or the reproductive value to less well, than as one. As possible, yeah. So are we trying to completely obliterate and eliminate the virus like they are in New Zealand? Or are we trying to suppress numbers and keep them very low so that the health service can cope? Because as I understand it, they're two different so, strategies. So our first strategy is primarily to prevent as many people from getting the infection so as to protect individuals from the impact of this infection. Mm -hmm. And for a small percentage of people, uh, this is a devastating disease. Uh, for 20% of people or so, it causes a requirement for people to be admitted to hospital. And we've seen a, a significant number of people here having to be admitted to intensive care. We build the capacity of our health system to deal with an eventuality where many more people than we would like end up impacted. Uh, and as to whether we need to then use that capacity, that will be something that we'll know as we go along. But our primary reason for trying to have these measures in place is to protect people in the first instance rather than protecting the health service. The protecting the health service is for the purpose of ensuring that it's there if, if, if we're, we're not as successful as we might otherwise be in, in limiting the number of people who are impacted. In terms of, and we've heard something, as you rightly say, from New Zealand and elsewhere of the possibility of elimination uh, of this virus, uh, I think that's going to be a challenge for the, for the international community. Um, we, we, uh, we, we, we know we're dealing with a virus where there is asymptomatic transmission. Uh, in a globalized world where there is travel, 
it'll be impossible to fully eliminate, if you like, the possibility of continued importation of cases. I think, as Philip has said, that a number of countries that are, as it were, ahead of us, either in terms of the control that they've established or ahead of us in terms of the release of some of the measures that they're proposing to release in other European countries, will give us a good understanding of what happens uh, in, a, in a post, if you like, uh, restriction situation, what happens to a country that has been successful, if you like, in containing or, or suppressing infection when, uh, uh, let's say, inward migration of individuals or travel starts to happen and cases start to get imported. Uh, and we, with the global community will be watching and learning from those things to try to continue to inform our ongoing strategy and how we deal with this. So just so I understand that, so does that mean that it's still open, like that we haven't made a final decision on that, we're still seeing what happens with countries that are a little bit ahead of us before we make a... Because I, I, I presume sure. that different measures are introduced depending on the end goal. So, 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 so nothing is final. Uh, because this is a disease, uh, this is now the month of April, a disease that most people hadn't heard about uh, three months ago. Uh, and and uh, for the most part, um, um, uh, we knew very little about it at the beginning. Um, there are still significant unknowns about this virus, about the impact of, of, its, uh, of transmission of this virus, what happens in situations whereby when measures are lifted, uh, what happens in, in, the, in the, if you like, in, the, in, in a period of time when the restrictions are reduced, how quickly... Uh, spread of the virus might recur. All of those things are unknowns. Our strategy is about ensuring that we have a range of measures in place available to us and a responsiveness in terms of our capacity to pick up infection on an ongoing basis that allows us to respond and to adapt. I don't think we'd be saying, look, we have an absolute certainty uh, as to the answers to some of those questions that you have. All the kinds of things that are going to play into this would be the availability of vaccine, the effectiveness of vaccine down the line, the availability of antiviral drugs in the, in the, in the, in the intervening time, and a range of other uh, learning, if you like, that will be happening on an ongoing basis. So I'd like to see or describe our strategy uh, as a, a responsive one uh, in terms of, the, let's say, the arrangements that we have in place uh, across government and then the extent to which we have to deploy them being informed by what we see happening and the growing understanding internationally of the behaviour of this disease. <laughs> no, that's... It was a supplementary question. If I could ask just about um, deaths in nursing homes. You said last night, I think you were asked about this, or deaths of nursing home residents, that you were hoping to have that data tonight. Are those figures tonight? Were you, were you able to get that data? I don't have that data with me tonight. Um, we know that most of the deaths in terms of place of occurrence, as I've said, are happening in a hospital environment. Um, and we think we'll be in a position uh, probably tomorrow to give a little more detail in relation to the experience in nursing homes where we have seen a challenge, for, particularly for some individual nursing homes, in terms of the spread of infection in those settings that have impacted both staff and patients at probably significantly higher percentages than would have occurred in the general community. But i would be in a position to give more of an update on that tomorrow, I expect. Thanks, Susan. Okay, um, George. Philip, looking at your, your graph, um, it's based on analysis done two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So you know a lot more than that graph. Uh, and I noticed that you have 100,000 as the first peak, which would be in about 10 days' time mm -hmm. or so. And then you have 60,000, which probably is in about maybe 30 days' time or mm -hmm. thereabouts. And the relationship between the two re um, uh, reproduction rates, one is about 60% of the other, the 2.7 is about 60%. Am I right to be thinking that that's kind of a relationship to look at? If you go down to one, are we looking at about 25,000 at the peak? No, no, no. It, it, it's an utterly non-linear relationship. Non-linear, okay. Yeah. So, so if you get R down to one, what you expect is that the number of new cases per day doesn't increase at all that every, every, every person infects one other person okay. and then they get better and you, you're left with the, with the next person. And this is the issue, that even having an R of 1.3 or 1.4, you'll be in a position where you lose control of the disease. So this is why we're in the territory of suppression. Mm -hmm. uh, not elimination, but suppression, bringing the transmission of the virus down to the lowest manageable level within the population. But on the basis of that, the surge 
that people have often spoke about, spoken about is a good bit away. Well, it, we, in fact, we haven't spoken about a surge. Yeah. We've I been know, asked but, about it. Yeah, we, yeah. we haven't I know spoken that. about it. I know yeah. that, but people have spoken yeah. about it. Yeah. We, we, we shouldn't be expecting a surge. Don't we shouldn't expect be a surge. expecting a peak. We should flatten this curve so much that we're distributing over a long period of time, and there isn't an identifiable surge or peak within that. Okay, and I know this, sorry, this is a supplementary, but how long do you think it'll be for you to update that, given that that analysis is two weeks old? So, so the analysis still stands. Uh, what, what, what the update is, it, it would have been imprudent for me to assume we could get the R down to 1 or down to 0.8. It's, it's a huge challenge for the Irish population. As we're seeing them getting towards that number, we can rerun the models with these reduced reproduction rates and begin to see how the disease will spread over the next few months. You sound like you've been very impressed by the reduction. Yes, yeah. Okay. And um, I'll leave it at that. Okay, okay. thanks, George. Uh, Richard. Thanks very much, Richard Downs from Prime Time. In, in relation to the um, lockdown, as they call it, the restrictions on, uh, on, on citizens at the moment due to expire on Sunday, are you in a position to make recommendations now as to how long... Uh, those restrictions should be in place, and what are those recommendations that you're considering? So uh, we'll be in a position to consider that at our meeting of the National Public Health Emergency Team tomorrow morning, Richard, uh, and based on some of the information that we have available from the modelling team, that will improve our ability to be able to, if you like, consider that and to make a recommendation, which in the first instance we'll be sharing with them, um, with the Minister and with, with Taoiseach and Government, uh, and then that will be part of whatever communications happen tomorrow. Uh, so that's the kind of time frame for that. Okay, and in relation to the factors which will determine that, the R number obviously will be one? So a number of factors, as I've said before, relating to the disease, and then other factors that also relate to our capacity in, in, in an, on an ongoing basis to test, to contact trace, to follow up the contacts, to have information flowing in relation to all of that, all of those things. So it's two groups of issues, if you like, that feed into our ongoing assessment around measures, uh, how appropriate it is to keep them in place, uh, and, and, and what should follow in terms of um, uh, any change in those measures, and then also uh, uh, the length of time that they should apply to. So we'll, we, we'll be in a position to make all that clear tomorrow. So, Richard. So thank you. Um, the 500 confirmed cases today, how many tests did that result from? Is question one and question two maybe for um, uh, uh, Philip Nolan. Um, so you're talking about, if I understand, that the growth rate in confirmed cases has declined a lot. But because we're still only doing limited testing, is that not kind of a bit of a false tank? So maybe for this, those two, please. So we, we, we did have a look at the number of tests per day. I'm not going to give a precise number because I don't have that specific number. We looked at the number of tests over a number of days and to check in terms of the positivity rate was the change in terms of the number of cases that we're giving today, 500 compared to, I think, 360 or so yesterday, something to do with the underlying disease or something to do with the fact that we did more testing. Mm. And we think it's much more of the latter than the former. So, so it's around the positivity rate of in and around 20% is what we're seeing at the moment in terms of... But what's the actual absolute total of tests that were done to result in 500? So, so we, we, we give you a total of that every week on okay. a Tuesday up to the, up, up to the Monday, but we, ne we, we can tell you now that it's well, well above 50,000 tests that have been done at this moment in time. We're mm -hmm. substantially increasing the number of tests day on day. Uh, and as I've said before, the challenge for us now, which we accept, is that we need to grow that total testing capacity uh, significantly greater than it is at the moment, not to a number so much as to an ability, an ability to be able to test all of the people who need to be tested and have real-time reporting of those results, which is, in effect, a result available on the day of testing or on the following day. Okay. And maybe. So you, the, the trend line that I showed you there was unadjusted. You, you can run statistical. So we've been able to monitor, for instance, the delay in testing, and we can backdate a delayed test to when the person was tested. So there's, there's ways of... Uh, checking your time series for if you're under-reporting or if there are delays in reporting. Um, and it changes the shape of that line, but doesn't change much the decline in growth rate. So we're, we're more than confident uh, that, that that reduction in growth rate averaged over that period of time represents a, a, a real phenomenon. And then, of course, we're also checking it against rates of hospitalization, rates of admission to intensive care, and other markers of the disease to see do they cross-correlate, and they do. Thanks, David. 
Sorry, Diane McConnell from the Irish Examiner. Tony, um, the, my colleagues in Cork for the last 10 days have been monitoring operations at Parky Cueve, and also uh, we've been monitoring events and uh, kind of uh, testing here in Croke Park. And what we've shown is that there's been either very little or no activity day on day. And I'm just wondering, how does that correlate or sit with your numbers that you're increasing testing? Because essentially these are the two biggest testing centres in the country. Um, I just, um, the, the, the numbers test are swabbed as a function of how many people are referred through the health link process by GPs. And mm. since the case definition was tightened up there some weeks ago, uh, the numbers fell from a quite high figures of 15 to 20,000 per day to some upwards of about 2,000, just over 2,000 per day. So we have the capacity at, at these centres, which are number nearly 50, uh, mm. to accommodate all the demand coming through that health link system from GPs out in the community. And we have the capacity within hospitals to accommodate demand for testing in the hospital. The block, as we had, wasn't at the testing level in Parker Keeve yeah. or the other nearly 50 centres. The block was in the reagent for the lab, which we're working on at the moment. So, so uh, there's no. Um, there was a time a couple of weeks ago uh, when Parker Keeve unit was closed, as were other centres, because we didn't have the swab material. We succeeded in getting a. Uh, but even today, like we had people Sorry? in Parky Queef today and said that there was no, nothing we, going we, on there. We haven't had to open all the testing centres, okay. but there's, it, it, we, we, we can now, through those testing centres, accommodate the demand coming through right across the country. Okay. The, the, the block, if anything, we had was our, our ability to ah, process those tests at lab level with reagents. So it's a reagent issue as well? Reagent is, is well, and the shortage of reagent, which is a worldwide issue, mm. and our, our attempts, and our, uh, which I hope will be come to success very soon to secure a steady supply of reagents and testing where, the, where, where it was leading to, a, to a, a, slow, a slowing of that pathway through what was a quite a complex testing pathway from referral in the community through swabbing in, a, in one of those almost 50 centres we set up over a short time period through to the expanded number of labs we have in the public and private sector mm. to process those swabs and then give the result to the patient and inform the public health activities. Okay, but there would be some, uh, I suppose, public concern that you know, these were designated as the largest testing centres in the country, mm -hmm. looking or acting like they're virtually idle at this stage. We, we, what would we, you say we, to those public we, concerns? At this point in time, with the case definition as it is, it's able to meet the, meet the demand coming through the, the referral system. Okay. It may be in the coming weeks that there will be, we will adopt or look for a more loose, a more sensitive case definition, which will result in more people being referred for testing. At, at a different stage in the cycle of this pandemic. That's, what's ha that's what happens during cycles of pandemic. The case definition may change and, and the testing criteria may change. The testing criteria as they apply now, we're able to meet the demand at, at our testing centres. We've had problems at the lab as all countries have had right across the world. My second question, Tony, in relation to the, sure. the Department of Education have basically said they're waiting for your recommendation uh, in relation to the state exams. Can you give any indication as to what the thinking might be there? So we, we continue to engage with the Department of Education as we do with all other government departments in relation to, uh, if you like, a whole range of different uh, both social, economic and societal implications arising, of which that's clearly just one. Uh, we'll continue to engage with them over the next period of time, understand completely and very sensitive to uh, the impacts, all of the impacts, and in particular for Leaving Cert students uh, who are in a situation uh, of uncertainty mm -hmm. and so on, and we've tried to bring as much certainty to that as quickly as we possibly can and continue to engage with our, um, with our, our, our colleagues in the Department of Education to that end. I think I would take the opportunity to encourage leaving certain students in any situation to, to keep studying and learning. So, so as I say, on an ongoing basis, we'll continue to consider those issues. We'll make all of the advice that we have available to our colleagues on a cross-government basis, and that will help them to inform the decisions that they may have to take in respect of their individual sectors. And, and the example that you're giving me here of the Leaving Cert is, is just one of those. Yeah. Hey, Shane Beatty from News Talk. Tony, you uh, talk a lot about the advice and considering the advice of the European Centre for Disease Control. Uh, they have a report out now where they're saying that face masks uh, could be used to reduce the spread of infection in places like uh, supermarkets and in public transport. So I'm just wondering, is the advice the public going to change about the wearing of, of uh, masks? Not, not in respect of that. Uh, we have advice as well from the WHO this week uh, in terms of the use of face masks for the, um, for the general public. Uh, what we've been saying is that we want, if, 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 if you were advised as an individual uh, or if you were to wear any form of personal protective equipment as an individual, it will be something that will be advised to you by your doctor. Uh, otherwise, uh, we, 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 we don't recommend the, the general use. There are downsides, as we've said before, in terms of the use of, 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 of face masks in the public. I may ask 
uh, Dr. Henry to come in on that, uh, but our essential supplies in relation to all of things, the priority for us is to ensure that they're available to people uh, who particularly need them, and those are our healthcare workers. Colm, do you want to? Yeah, just and, uh, again to reiterate, uh, there are some patients for whom this advice might be appropriate, and that depends on what their own GPs or hospital specialists say to them. Um, but there's, there are, uh, it, it, it doesn't necessarily confer an advantage. There's evidence, indeed, that they may confer a disadvantage, that people who, who don't understand the proper use of chain, face masks, how, how to change them, how to apply them, uh, may end up touching their face more and thereby putting themselves at risk for transmitting the virus from their hand where they pick it up from a surface to their, to their face. So there are downsides too. To, it might seem intuitively obvious that a face mask confers protection, um, but in fact it may add to your risk. Okay, and just my second question, Tony, could you give clarity on uh, hardware stores and garden centres? Because I understand that the, the new laws signed by Simon Harris they can legally open, they're considered an essential retail outlet like news agents and pharmacies, but yet they're closed and apparently the government want them to be closed. So as CMO, should hardware stores and garden centres be open and why are they on a list of essential outlets? So, so we have identified the range of different working with colleagues on a cross-government basis, both essential and non-essential work. Uh, and if there are, are, are um, if, if people are involved, if the public is involved in travelling to places that are that are non that are non essential, uh, that will be something that the regulations provide for. And our advice clearly uh, is for people to stay with us to avoid uh, uh, going to and travelling to uh, uh, in circumstances other than essential circumstances. We've set out the very limited range of those. They're travel to the kind. They're travel for, for the purpose of things like grocery shopping visiting a pharmacy, supporting a vulnerable person in your own family, that kind of thing, uh, uh, and then travelling if you're an essential worker. In all other circumstances, and that's for everybody else in the population, the advice now at the moment is to stay at home and to stay at home for the period of time that we recommend, and that continues to be the situation. I understand completely and have enormous sympathy uh, the, the, the challenge that this is for individuals and the fatigue that builds in over time. Uh, with these measures and the challenge that they represent for individuals. But we're saying that we need to continue to, to get more improvement from the social distancing measures that are in place. We want the public to continue to work with us. We think that would be very important in achieving the kind of scenario that, 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 that uh, Philip Nolan has outlined. So in your view, just uh, on, on that, is our hardware stores and garden centres essential retail outlets or not? In my view, they are not. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Holan, you indicated two days ago that you couldn't really consider recommending a relaxation of the current restrictions until you had A, seen a further reduction in the growth of new cases, and B, uh, we had greater capacity for testing and contact tracing. If the new case count miraculously fell to zero tomorrow and remained there for a fortnight, how, how long would it take for the infrastructure to be in place uh, to allow us to go ahead with that? So these are things that we work with uh, um, in parallel, our ongoing assessment of the disease. I'm really not anticipating the scenario, the very optimistic scenario that you're describing of getting down to, uh, to zero uh, on a sustained basis for 14 days. What I said in the early part of the week was that uh, Friday would be the day when we'd make that assessment formally and make the advice available formally and that the factors that would go into the decision would be factors on an ongoing basis as, as they will continue to be in relation to the behaviour of the disease and while we've seen encouragement uh, from some of the information that we have shared with you tonight, some of the information we've shared with you before. Uh, we still think there is further progress that we need to make and we want to make uh, and to continue to, to push that reproductive number down as low as we can get it uh, and we'll continue to track the infection over that time period. And in parallel with that, we will, we will look at all the other aspects of our readiness which includes a significant step up from where we are at the moment in relation to the full capacity. Uh, around our public health management of this, which is around the case identification, uh, the testing, uh, the recommendation for testing, the, the swabbing, the testing of those swabs, the contact tracing that results, the follow-up of those contacts, uh, which may involve testing of those at a point in time, uh, and also the, the, the information systems to support our management of all of that. And all of that is happening uh, uh, with, with, the, with, with the greatest, if you like, of priority to try and ensure that we're in a position to when the time is right, and not before, recommend a change in terms of the, uh, the arrangements that are currently in place. And a second question then, uh, maybe not so much pertinent to the current phase, but to later phases, that there are absolutely enormous public policy trade-offs 
mm. involved in what's happening here. Uh, you know, it's not just health versus economics. It can yeah. also be health versus health in that mm. there are, you know, it's reduced GP visits, people are reluctant to go to hospitals. There may be some procedures that are now having to be deferred, transplants and Absolutely. things. Uh, who is weighing up these factors against one another? Is that happening uh, within the National Health Emergency Team? Is it happening in consultation between that and political leadership, or is it happening at Cabinet? Who's, who's calling the shots? So, uh, in terms of the public health issues, uh, we're considering all the issues from a public health point of view that relate to COVID. We're also identifying, if you like, that there is, as you've rightly said, and I'm going to take the opportunity that your question gives me to remind the public and people who are listening to this, that uh, our health service is still open for the kinds of things that people need to come to the health service with. We know in terms of the numbers of either uh, emergency admissions, attendances at the health system, and also presentations for uh, less urgent but, 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 but still high priority attendances that we're not seeing the kinds of numbers that we should see. So the public we know is probably out of understandable concern staying away from health centres and from hospitals and from general practices as a result of fear of picking up the virus. And I think the message we'd want to give is that it's, uh, it's, it's for the health service itself uh, to, to, to protect you when you attend in circumstances that you should from picking up this virus in as much as it possibly could and to not have that as a fear if people have a concern about the usual things that would prompt somebody to attend a, a, a GP or, or to make contact with a GP or to attend an emergency department uh, that people shouldn't, shouldn't be concerned and shouldn't avoid. I've given you stories uh, in the past uh, about our observation of empty waiting rooms in, in emergency departments at times when you'd expect to see nothing other than full waiting rooms. Uh, and that's a concern to us. So that's one of the things we'll, tr we'll track from a health system point of view to look at what, the, what the, the overall impact of that. But in terms of the message, in terms of population behaviour, I couldn't say that more strongly and say that more urgently than we are saying that now because we know that, the only health, that COVID is not the only health issue that's affecting the Irish population right now. Uh, in terms of the wider question, um, we, are, we are working with other government departments and will be so. Uh, we understand that this is having profound impacts on the economy and society and how it functions and a range of other uh, impacts on people in their everyday lives and all of that weighs very heavily on us. Uh, as we move into a situation, as we contemplate the ongoing impact of these measures, contemplate potential changes of those, we will need to work with, with partners and other government departments and agencies to help to understand uh, what, the, what the economic and social impact is of some of the measures that are currently in place so that if we are in a position to step back from some of these um, um, restrictions, if I can call them that, that are in place, that the ones we choose are the ones that have the greatest benefit in societal terms or in economic terms and the, and the least effect in terms of, 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 of public health. Thank you. Michelle Hennessy from the Journal Dali. Uh, just the one question for me this evening, I'd be glad to hear. Earlier this evening, um, Michal Martin, after a meeting with the Taoiseach and other party leaders, said that uh, 53,000 tests have been done so far and that there are 51,000 people waiting to have a sample taken. Um, now, particularly on the sampling, I think, Colm, you had er indicated earlier this week that there effectively isn't a backlog in the sampling process. So are those figures correct? So, so there is a, and I've given you figures in relation to the German, uh, so there, there is a process underway at the moment to, for some of the tests that have been taken and where getting them through the testing process wasn't as quick as we would like uh, to try and catch up with that testing and that's ongoing right at the moment and I've given you those figures every day over the course of this week in terms of the numbers of those tests done and the numbers positive and we'll continue to do that until we get to the end of those which uh, I expect will be a number of other days before we get to the end of that and where we get to then hopefully uh, within days uh, I mean, during the course of next week I expect that we're in, in the kind of situation that Dr Henry described whereby our supply of testing uh, is in excess of the demand that we have and that's where we want to go and we want to grow substantially our test, testing capacity from there but again I emphasize to not get focused on testing as the only issue for us it doesn't obscure as I've said many times before and you're probably bored of me saying uh, uh, the importance for individuals of self-isolating when they have symptoms, imagining uh, that if they, if they have symptoms uh, that are COVID-like, that COVID is the disease uh, until such time as they're tested and they have a test result that shows otherwise uh, and they self-isolate for 14 days and their household contacts restrict their movements. That's the key measure in terms of prevention of the transmission of this virus and that the goal of our management is about prevention of the transmission of this virus 
the information that P Professor Nolan has shared with you this evening is that we have very substantially impacted that. And these curves are telling you, among other things, that we, we have, as a, as a country, saved many people's lives, saved hospitalization, saved admissions to intensive care units in very large numbers as a consequence of this. But it's come at uh, uh, a significant cost in terms of the impact that we've had to endure as a society. Um, uh, uh, but it is important to point that out, that testing is not the only component of this that's important in terms of our public health management. Could I maybe just ask that, that column come in on, on the swab backlog? You know that what I said earlier was I stand by that. So the 51,000 figure is wrong? I don't know where that came from. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, just uh, Jack Power of the Irish Times. Mm. Just in relation to the, I suppose, the, the country's borders, to the border in the north and south, and with the um, England and the rest of Britain as well, I suppose, is there any fear that as the crisis kind of develop, develops in England and the rest of the UK, that it could potentially be kind of travel to Ireland to, I suppose, try and weather out the virus here due to a perception that it may be kind of safer and more remote. Is that kind of on the radar at all of the public health team in terms of travel from the UK? So we, we keep the whole question of travel under review. We visit that particular question every time we meet. Uh, we know in terms of airline travel um, in through, the, through the ports here, that we're down to a very small percentage of what would be usual levels of travel, uh, well below 10%, perhaps even below 5%. Uh, and the kinds of people coming through and the numbers of people coming through are very, very limited in terms of uh, um, to, to individuals who are either returning citizens and all of whom will have to, and I remind people whenever uh, opportunity I get, subject themselves to the 14-day um, self-quarantine period upon arrival back in the country, um, or to individuals who, who may be coming here for reasons of essential travel, for example, uh, if they're involved in the, in the haulage and, and essential supplies. We need to keep the supply lines open in terms of uh, uh, the measures that are in place to keep the country fed, to keep us supplied with medications and other essential equipment and so on. That's very important. Um, and and we, do, we don't think there's really uh, any form of uh, substantial other travel happening. Um, um, and so we haven't, we, haven't, we, we haven't identified that as a particular factor or concern, the one that you're raising there, Jack. I suppose it's kind of on a similar vein, kind of looking back in terms of, um, I suppose, importing cases um, to do with contract tracing and Cheltenham. Kind of we're a good few weeks on now in terms of the, the contract tracing process. Have we kind of been able to, um, uh, I suppose, kind of feel out um, if there was a significant uptake in cases imported from people who travel to the Cheltenham Festival. Have we any kind of clarity on that uh, with hindsight now? So we, we have ongoing information from our contact tracing teams. Uh, we, we capture you know, a certain minimum data set, if I can put it that way, from each of the contacts so that we can have an ongoing understanding of the, the behavior and the source of contacts and, and, and so on. Um, and some of the additional information that we have uh, coming from those contact tracing teams uh, would give us a, a, some insight into that. Uh, as to what the percentage of cases is that could result from that, I don't have that figure with you at this moment in time, uh, but it's something that, that we look at. Um, we don't think that travel from there has, has made an, a significant uh, um, or changed significantly the risk of infection in this country. Uh, we think for the most part that travel was a phenomenon in the early stages of this, as, we, as we've said. We stayed in line with uh, both international um, uh, advice and guidance from the ECDC and from the WHO in terms of any of the measures that we had in place in, 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 within the country uh, for borders, for travel through the borders of the country, for travel through the ports of the country at every point in time. And any of the evidence, if you like, and guidance that we had in place at time was appropriate to that place in time in terms of attendance at mass gatherings, whether those are mass gatherings taking place in the country or taking place outside of the country. And we were probably ahead of some other countries in terms of some of the steps that we, we, we took around specific mass gatherings here, as you know, in relation to rugby matches, in relation to St. Patrick's Day Parade and so on.